The subject of our discussion today is fire. Fires from God and fires from men. And in particular, the way they appear in adjacent passages in Leviticus chapter 9 and chapter 10. Let's begin our discussion by seeing the relevant passages in these two chapters, and I think it'll become immediately obvious. We have quite a bit to discuss in order to understand just what message these words are conveying to us. In Leviticus chapter 9, to review in brief the background that precedes the verses that are cited here on the page, we read of the sacrificial service that Aaron is commanded to perform in readying the dedication of the tabernacle. And so it is in this regard then that in chapter 9, verse 22, we read, And Aaron lifted up his hands toward the people and blessed them, and he came down from offering the sin offering and the burnt offering and the peace offerings. And then Moses and Aaron came into the tent of meeting and came out and blessed the people and the glory of God appeared unto all the people. And of course, this is critical. The glory of God appearing in the sight of everyone. And in what manner is God's glory manifest? Verse 24 and there came forth fire from before God and consumed upon the altar, the burnt offering and the fat. And when all the people saw it, they shouted or sang praises and fell on their faces. The glory of God and the fire. Now, I feel compelled to add here an observation that I'm sure is obvious to everyone, so obvious that I apologize if it's an insult for me to even spell this out explicitly, but nonetheless, God is not the fire. God is not in the fire. Indeed, not only is the fire not to be equated with God, the glory of God is not to be equated with God. The glory of God is the way we perceive God manifest to us in this world. And it is clearly in that vein that the glory of God appeared unto all the people as the fire that came forth from before God. So to use a crude analogy as a kind of illustration when we watch a puppet show we know the puppet is not the puppeteer the puppet does however give us something of an indication of what the puppeteer wants us to perceive and in the same vein then we should appreciate this is what the glory of God appearing as the fire signifies for us. It indicates to us how we are to perceive God being manifest to us in the world because God does clearly want us to perceive him manifest in this world. That's the fire that came forth from before God. And then there's another fire. A fire so very different, so terrifyingly different. It seems hard to even conceive of the gap between the verses that describe these two fires being only a couple of verses. But indeed, we then read in chapter 10, 
of another fire. In chapter 10, verse 2, and there came forth fire from before God and devoured. In the Hebrew, exactly the same words as in chapter 9, verse 24. In the Hebrew, translated here as came forth fire from before God and consumed, but consumed, devoured. These are both translations of the same word in the Hebrew. There came forth fire from before God and devoured, consumed them, them being the sons of Aaron. And they died before God. What occasioned the deaths of Aaron's sons? We read in verse 1, And Nadab and Abihu, the sons of Aaron, took each of them his censer and put fire therein and laid incense thereon and offered strange fire before God. Note, tantalizingly, the same expression, before God, in the Hebrew, lifnei Hashem. Strange fire before God, which he had not commanded them. And the consequence is this fire that comes forth and consumes them. What a terrifying difference between these two fires. And clearly, part of our mission today is to understand what the Torah is teaching us in the juxtaposition of these two fires. But first, you know, we might have thought that, well, maybe the sons of Aaron were just bad people. Maybe they just had it coming to them. Before we continue, we should consider one more verse in chapter 10, verse 3. Then Moses said unto Aaron, This is it that God spoke, saying, Through them that are nigh unto me, or near to me, I will be sanctified. And for all the people, I will be glorified. Now, Moses is saying to Aaron that these two men, his sons, Nadav and Abihu, are the ones who are near to God. Nearer, so it would appear, than even Moses and Aaron themselves. Now, of course, one might be inclined to say, okay, so he said it. It was intended as consolation, so don't take it too seriously. To which I have two crucial responses. Number one, remember, we're talking about Moses. Moses is a man of truth. Moses speaks God's truth. And here, unequivocally, what he says to Aaron is, this is that God spoke. Through them that are nigh unto me, I will be sanctified. Certainly, Moses is not going to say something untrue in God's name. And indeed, we'll note that when in Leviticus chapter 16, we read a recapitulation of the deaths of Aaron's sons. In verse 1, God spoke unto Moses after the death of the two sons of Aaron, when they drew near before God and died. Scripture testifies they drew near before God. And I'm sure it's clear to us all we aren't speaking geographically. It's not a matter of where they were standing. Who they were, they were indeed, as Moses testified, near to God and died. That's my first answer in responding to the argument that perhaps these words of consolation shouldn't be taken too seriously. The second, on a more intimate plane, is the realization that words of consolation that are insincere or untrue 
are of no avail at all. Here, we read, and Aaron held his peace. Clearly, Aaron knew that what his brother had said to him was true. But with that realization that they were, at least on some plane, near to God, of course, the difficulty here manifestly becomes only that much greater. So why do they die? What is this fire that consumes? That on the one hand, again, in chapter 9, verse 24, consumed the offerings and made it clear to everyone that the glory of God appeared unto all the people on the one hand. And on the other hand, also as means for God's glory to be revealed. Because, again, in chapter 10, verse 3, I will be glorified, God says, also through the fire. But a fire that devours, that destroys. Nadav and Avihu died. Clearly, the implications of these two passages and the juxtaposition between them are critical for us if we're to understand what are we supposed to be doing with fire in general in our lives in this world. Now, in order to attempt to address these questions, I think a good starting point is to focus a bit further on what fire signifies. In particular, what fire signifies as we find it with respect to God. And so, what I'd like to share with you very swiftly is an overview in Scripture of God and fire. That is, fires that come from God. And with that, we begin with Genesis chapter 15. God's covenant with the first of the patriarchs, with Abraham. The covenant between the pieces, between the bisected offerings. We read in chapter 15, verse 17. And it came to pass that when the sun went down and there was thick darkness, behold, a smoking furnace and a flaming torch that passed between these pieces. In that day, God made a covenant with Abram. Now, again, at the risk of belaboring the obvious, I stress, God is not the flaming torch. God isn't in the flaming torch. But simultaneously, the flaming torch is a means through which we perceive God's presence manifest. In this case, Abraham perceives God's presence manifest as party to the covenant that God makes with him here. This is fire number one with the first of the patriarchs. And then in Exodus chapter three, God's initial revelation to his faithful shepherd, Moses, his messenger. Everyone knows what the context was. In Exodus chapter 3, verse 1, now Moses was keeping the flock of Jethro, his father-in-law, the priest of Midian, and he led the flock to the farthest end of the wilderness and came to the mountain of God, unto Choreb. In verse 2, and the angel of God appeared unto him in a flame of fire. Once again, fire. Out of the midst of the bush. And he saw, and behold, the bush burned with fire. And the bush was not consumed. And this is the basis of God's revelation to Moses. God called unto him out of the midst of the bush, the burning bush. Out of the midst of the fire. Now, of course, these two initial examples both pertain to individuals, Abraham and Moses. When the nation, as nation, emerges from bondage in Egypt, 
How is God revealed to them? We turn to Exodus chapter 13, verse 21. And God went before them by day in a pillar of cloud to lead them the way, and by night in a pillar of fire to give them light that they might go by day and by night. The pillar of cloud by day and the pillar of fire by night. A sight so extraordinary, so indelibly etched upon the consciousness of the nation that we read likewise in Psalm 78, verse 14. By day also he led them with a cloud and all the night with a light of fire. Psalm 105, verse 39. He spread a cloud for a screen and fire to give light in the night. And even centuries later, after the Babylonian exile, upon the return to the land of Israel, we read in Nehemiah, in chapter 9, verse 12, Moreover, in a pillar of cloud, you did lead them by day, and a pillar of fire by night, to give them light in the way wherein they should go. And even after they sinned, even after the golden calf, in verse 19, yet you in your manifold mercies forsook them not in the wilderness. The pillar of cloud departed not from over them by day to lead them in the way, neither the pillar of fire by night to show them light and the way wherein they should go. Now, of course, in all these passages, we see not only the motif of fire, but also the pillar of cloud. The fire is what lightens the night, what shows them the way. And I'll stress here in particular, in light of what we've discussed previously, the symbolism of night. As we see it so aptly expressed in Psalm 92, verse 3, to declare your loving kindness in the morning and your faithfulness in the night seasons. There are times of life, the night seasons, that are dark, that are vague, that are unclear. As opposed to the morning when we can declare God's loving kindness because we can see God's loving kindness. Everything is clear to us. There are the nights when nothing is clear, when we are sustained by your faithfulness. And it is even in the realm of the night that we can see clearly when we have the fire. The fire that once again serves as the instrument through which we perceive God manifest in our midst, through which we perceive the glory of God. This, in the entire trek in the wilderness, but simultaneously we should note that there is one domain in which the significance of the fire is dramatically and repeatedly expressed, and that is at the revelation at Sinai. When, of course, we perceive God's presence manifest to us with greater intensity than any time before. In Exodus chapter 19, verse 18, Now Mount Sinai was altogether on smoke because God descended upon it in fire. And as a kind of summation, in Exodus chapter 24, verse 17, and the appearance of the glory of God. Note, once again, the glory of God was like devouring fire. It's not God, but it is glory. His glory is manifest to us. We perceive his presence through the devouring fire. This becomes all the more dramatically articulated in the recapitulation of the revelation at Sinai, that we read in Deuteronomy chapter 4 and chapter 5, in Deuteronomy chapter 4, verse 11, and you came near and stood under the mountain, and the mountain burned with fire unto the heart of heaven. Verse 12, and God spoke unto you out of the midst of the fire. In verse 15, a warning, 
Take you therefore good heed unto yourselves, for you saw no manner of form on the day that God spoke unto you in Choreb, out of the midst of the fire. And further amplifying this point, asking rhetorically in verse 33, did ever a people hear the voice of God speaking out of the midst of the fire? And finally in this vein, in verse 36, again, repeating this theme, upon earth he made you to see his great fire. You heard his words out of the midst of the fire. Likewise, in Deuteronomy chapter 5, to drive this point home, in verse 4, God spoke with you face to face in the mount out of the midst of the fire. And in the continuation, after we read the words of the Decalogue, in summation, in retrospect, in verse 18, these words God spoke unto all your assembly in the mount out of the midst of the fire. It is, as we read in verse 19, while the mountain did burn with fire, that you then were terrified. In verse 20, you said, Behold, God our Lord has shown us his glory and his greatness, and we have heard his voice out of the midst of the fire. We have seen this day that God does speak with man and live. Verse 21, now therefore why should we die? For this great fire will consume us. We can't take it. We note here the same kind of ambivalence that we noted in Leviticus chapters 9 and 10. Fire is the means through which we are able to sense God's glory and simultaneously this great fire will consume us. We'll return to that ambivalence shortly. But in the meantime, continuing this progression, of course, as we've noted in other contexts as well, the revelation at Sinai was a one-time event. The perpetuation of the intimacy that took place at Sinai is through the tabernacle. So it should, of course, come as a surprise to no one that just as the fire is such a significant motif at Sinai, so too we read at the end of the book of Exodus. In Exodus chapter 40, verse 38, once the tabernacle is erected, for the cloud of God was upon the tabernacle by day, and there was fire therein by night in the sight of all the house of Israel throughout all their journeys. And likewise, in Numbers chapter 9, in verses 15 and 16, we read with respect to the tabernacle, at evening there was upon the tabernacle as were the appearance of fire until morning, the appearance of fire by night, in that realm of night, of darkness, of murkiness, of lack of clarity. The fire shows us the way, shows us the inviolable truth that God's presence is revealed. Of course, predictably, the tabernacle itself is but the harbinger of the more established, ultimately more permanent framework through which God's glory is revealed, and that is at the site of the Holy Temple. First, when King David is summoned to erect an altar to God at what will become the site of the Holy Temple, the threshing floor of Ornan, the Jebusite. We read in Chronicles 1, chapter 21, verse 26, And David built there an altar unto God, and offered burnt offerings and peace offerings, and called upon God, and he answered him from heaven by fire upon the altar of burnt offering. And when, in the following generation, King Solomon completes on that spot the construction of the Holy Temple 
We read in Chronicles 2, in chapter 7, verse 1, Now when Solomon made an end of praying, the fire came down from heaven and consumed the burnt offering and the sacrifices, and the glory of God filled the house. Of course, one can't help but note the parallel to the description of the glory of God in Leviticus chapter 9, which appeared unto all the people, verse 23, through the fire coming forth from before God and consuming upon the altar the burnt offering and the fat. Almost in the same words we read in the dedication of the Holy Temple, that the fire consuming the burnt offering and the sacrifices signifies that the glory of God filled the house, filled the temple. And again, in much the same vein, in verse 3, all the children of Israel saw when the fire came down and the glory of God was upon the house. This progression of God being manifest in his glory is a progression of fire. And finally, one last example that also pertains to the fire that comes from heaven. Ironically, outside of the precincts of the Holy Temple, even though the Holy Temple is standing in Jerusalem, on Mount Carmel, Haifa, the showdown of Elijah the prophet with the idolatrous prophets of Baal. We read in the first book of Kings, in chapter 18, that when Elijah proposes that the showdown be the God who answers by fire, after Elijah's prayer, in verse 38, then the fire of God fell and consumed the burnt offering and the wood and the stones and the dust and licked up all the water that was in the trench. And in verse 39, and when all the people saw it, they fell on their faces and they said, God, he is the Lord. God, he is the Lord. That realization, God is the Lord who is sovereign. Because we have seen God's glory manifest to us through the fire. Now, in all of the foregoing, We've seen fire as, again, the means through which we're able to sense God's presence manifest to us, God's glory, so to speak, revealed. But there is another aspect of fire. We saw this other aspect of fire explicitly articulated when the people in Deuteronomy chapter 5 verse 21 express their fear now therefore why should we die for this great fire will consume us if we hear the voice of god our lord anymore then we shall die fire also consumes and of course it is precisely that fire that consumes that we saw in Leviticus chapter 10, verse 2, there came forth fire from before God and devoured Nadav and Avihu, the sons of Aaron. The Hebrew, again I reiterate, is the same word. And so it is in this vein that we continue with this other aspect of fire. In Deuteronomy chapter 4, verse 24, when we are warned against the dire consequences of our succumbing to the allure of idolatry, the warning is, for God your Lord is a devouring fire, a zealous God. And using the same motif, in Deuteronomy chapter 9, when we are bidden to enter into the land where we will function as the instrument, of divine punishment against the depraved Canaanite inhabitants of the land. We're told in chapter 9, verse 3, 
Know therefore this day that God your Lord is he who passes over before you as a devouring fire. He will destroy them as devouring fire inevitably does. He will bring them down before you. So you shall drive them out and make them to perish quickly as God has spoken unto you. This is your mission. You are the instrument of bringing this deserved punishment upon them. But the way you succeed is because the one who is passing over before you, God, is a devouring fire. That theme of fire as the instrument of destruction, as the instrument of punishment, is one that we encounter in manifold contexts in the Bible as well. Starting in Genesis chapter 19, in verse 24, then God caused to rain upon Sodom and upon Gomorrah brimstone and fire from God out of heaven. God overthrew all those cities with brimstone and fire. And with respect to the Egyptians, although there isn't a plague of fire per se, in a way there is. Plague number seven, we read in Exodus chapter 9, verse 23, is that God sent thunder and hail and fire ran down upon the earth. The plague of hail. The plague of hail is there was hail and fire flashing up amidst the hail. And indeed, the theme of fire in the hail is one that likewise appears in the recapitulation of the plagues of Egypt. In Psalm 105, verse 32, he gave them hail for rain and flaming fire in their land. Fire, likewise, is an instrument of divine punishment against the Egyptians at the splitting of the sea, where we read in Exodus chapter 14, verse 24. And it came to pass in the morning watch that God looked forth upon the host of the Egyptians through the pillar of fire and of cloud and discomfited the host of the Egyptians. Now, fire is not only an instrument of divine punishment, divine wrath against heathens. In Numbers chapter 16, In verse 35, we read of the destruction of the cohorts of Korach in his rebellion. And in almost exactly the same words that we read of the punishment meted out to Nadav and Avihu, there it was, and there came forth fire from before God and devoured them. And here it is. And fire came forth from God and devoured the 250 men that offered the incense. And likewise, in a similar vein, in Numbers chapter 11, in verse 1, we read, And the people were as murmurers speaking evil in the ears of God, and when God heard it, his anger was kindled, and the fire of God burnt among them and devoured in the uttermost part of the camp, such that, the place is named Tabeira, meaning fire, because the fire of God burnt among them. And um, apropos of our citing earlier, the first book of Kings, chapter 18, the showdown of the prophet Elijah with the prophets of the Baal, we see the motif of fire. Fire coming from heaven, appearing in this destructive sense, also with respect to Elijah. In the second book of Kings, in chapter 1, when the captain of the 50 demands of Elijah to come down, in verse 10, Elijah answers, If I be a man of God, Let fire come down from heaven and consume you and your 50. And indeed, there came down fire from heaven and consumed him and his 50. Same thing happens in verse 12. That once again, 
Elijah says, if I be a man of God, let fire come down from heaven and consume you and your 50. And a fire of God came down from heaven and consumed him and his 50. Fire from heaven that destroys, that consumes, that devours. Finally, ultimately, in the world of the future. At the time of that final cataclysmic battle, the battle of the nations against God fought here in Jerusalem. We read of the battle of Gog and Magog in Ezekiel chapter 38, where on that day when Gog comes against the land of Israel, in verse 19, in my jealousy and in the fire of my wrath have I spoken, says God. The fire of God's wrath and indeed, in verse 22, the manner in which God's wrath is unleashed against the hordes of Gog and Magog include an overflowing shower and great hailstones, fire and brimstone. It is through that fire and brimstone that I will make myself known in the eyes of many nations, and they shall know that I am God. And even among the stay-at-home allies who didn't actually accompany the hordes of Gog and Magog to do battle against God in Jerusalem. In Ezekiel chapter 39, verse 6, I will send the fire on Magog and on them that dwell safely in the isles, and they shall know that I am God. And it's fire that teaches them that lesson. And finally, last example. In the third chapter of Yoel. Before the great and terrible day of God comes, we read in chapter 3, verse 3, I will show wonders in the heavens and in the earth, blood and fire and pillars of smoke. Fire. Pillars of smoke. I feel compelled at the risk of quibbling over details, to note that what is translated into the English as pillars of smoke is a unique term in the Hebrew that does not literally translate as pillars. In the Hebrew it is the timerot ashan, literally date palms of smoke. So the imagery inevitably is of the shape of a date palm of smoke. I leave it to your imagination. What sort of image that invokes smoke in the shape of a date palm? Maybe nowadays we are usually more inclined to describe smoke in that configuration as a mushroom cloud. But again, I'll leave this to your imagination and consideration. Just what sort of explosion is described here in chapter three of Joel as taking place before the great and terrible day of God comes. Now, to not conclude on quite so ominous a note, we'll continue one additional verse in verse 5. And it shall come to pass that whosoever shall call on the name of God shall be delivered. For in Mount Zion and in Jerusalem there shall be those that escape, as God has said, and among the remnants, those whom God shall call. These are the ones who escape, who are the remnants from the fire. The fire that does not only signify the glory of God manifest for us to perceive, but also the fire that destroys, the fire that leaves behind only remnants those who call on the name of God and are delivered.
two very different motifs associated with fire, which again, we'll note, very well reflect the two motifs that we see in Leviticus chapters 9 and 10. The fire that comes before God and consumes the offerings and serves as the means through which the people shout, sing praises because God's glory is revealed, and the fire that came forth from before God and devoured, consumed Nadav and Abihu, the sons of Aaron. What's going on? What indeed? does fire signify? And what are we to learn of it for ourselves? Before we can attempt to create a holistic picture to join together all of these, I think we need to consider an additional crucial ingredient. In order to understand what the fires that come from God signify, Let's consider the fires that come from man. Now, when I speak of fires coming from man, inevitably, the first place to explore is how we connect with fire altogether. How fire becomes part of the realm of humanity. And the truth is that we don't find any explicit answer to that question in Scripture. And yet, I think many of you have heard me discuss this very question, in particular, if you have joined us for the Havdalah ceremony at the end of the Sabbath, at the end of Shabbat. Now, one of the blessings, of course, in the Havdalah ceremony is the blessing over the fire. Blessed are you, God, our Lord, King of the universe, who creates the lights of the fire. And if you ask why we say the blessing on fire at the end of Shabbat, on the one hand, my response is because we read in Exodus chapter 35, verse 3, you shall kindle no fire throughout your habitations upon the Sabbath day. So the entire day of the Sabbath is a day upon which we don't light any fire. When we are again permitted to light fire after Shabbat ends, we bless God for creating the light of the fire. But in a way, perhaps we could say that begs the issue. Why fire? That is, we appreciate that one of the central themes of Shabbat altogether is we desist from creative activity. We become one with God and one with nature. And so creative labor is forbidden in Hebrew, melacha. But significant, isn't it, that the hallmark of such creativity Indeed, the only form of creative activity that is listed explicitly in the Torah is kindling fire. What's so significant about kindling fire? And to answer that question, I think it's important for us, indeed, to explore the origin of fire. The origin of fire from two very different perspectives, two of the greatest cultures of the ancient world, Greece and Israel. In these two cultures, there are tantalizingly two very different answers to the question of how fire comes into the world, very different, and yet the chair a crucial foundation, and that is, there is something divine about fire. In Greek mythology, fire was something that was jealously guarded by the gods. 
and therefore something that was indeed divine to which human beings had no access until Prometheus, one of the Titans, stole fire from the gods on Mount Olympus and brought fire to man. And what did he get as his recompense for having stolen fire from the gods? What we would describe as eternal torment, chained to a mountaintop, birds peck out his liver every day, only for it to regrow and be pecked out again the next day. All this for the crime of stealing fire from the gods. That, needless distress, is not the tradition of Israel. And what's the tradition of Israel? There's something manifestly divine of that fire, no doubt about it. In the tradition of Israel, Adam and Eve sinned just before the beginning of Shabbat, the beginning of the Sabbath. And so out of respect for Shabbat, despite their sin, the light of creation continued to shine all that night and all the next day until Shabbat ended. And then the world grew dark. Whereupon God bestowed upon man a mind as a reflection of the heavenly model. And man took two stones and rubbed them against one another and produced a spark. Again, there's something divine about fire. But of course, you note, besides that shared foundation, how these two perspectives are diametric opposites of one another. First obvious difference, it's not stolen. It's a gift, a gift from God. That's one difference. But I think there's an even more important difference. The more important difference is that the gift was not fire. The gift was the mind. The mind that enabled man to strike the stones, to produce the spark, to light the fire. An incalculably greater gift than merely giving man fire is giving man the mind to produce the fire. Because by doing so, God is bestowing not only the divine gift of fire, but the divine gift of man becoming godly, endowed with a mind that is a reflection of the heavenly model, the mind of God. Man can become, as it were, kind of divine himself. Ah, and herein lies the danger. Maybe we could even say the difference, the critical difference between these two aspects of fire. Because fire, on the one hand, serves as the means through which man can emulate God and be godly. Man comes into a world that otherwise would be cold and dark. The first thing that God creates as described at the beginning of Genesis is light. And according to this tradition, the first thing that Man creates at the end of the seven days of creation, at the end of Shabbat, is that terrestrial light, the fire. Man becomes, as it were, God's junior partner. Except there's also another very different incomparably bleaker 
alternative. And that is, man harnesses his creativity to make himself into a god. The ultimate idolatry, self-worship. I can do it all. Ironic, isn't it? The hallmark of human creativity, the quintessential creative labor is kindling fire. And through it, on the one hand, we can become godly. We could also pretend to become gods and turn our backs upon the one God. Bearing this in mind, we consider the role of fires that come from man. In Leviticus chapter 1, verse 7, we are told, And the sons of Aaron the priest shall put fire upon the altar and lay wood in order upon the fire. This is a mitzvah, a commandment to the priests. And in the same vein, in Leviticus chapter 6, we read from verse 2, command Aaron and his son, saying, This is the law of the burnt offering. It is that which goes up upon its firewood upon the altar all night until the morning. And the fire of the altar shall be kept burning thereby. And the fire upon the altar shall be kept burning thereby. It shall not go out. In verse 3, Fire shall be kept burning upon the altar continually. It shall not go out. Now, of course, we recall here what we just saw earlier in Leviticus chapter 9. Where did the fire come from? The fire comes from God. Chapter 9, verse 24, And there came forth fire from before God and consumed upon the altar the burnt offering and the fat. The fire comes from God. You might be inclined to say, well, if the fire came from God, who needs the sons of Aaron? But of course, at this point, we already know the answer. That's precisely the point. That is, specifically, the summons is for us, as it were, as God's junior partners, as he charges us, because this is a command from God. Again, it is command Aaron and his sons in our obedience of God's summons, we kindle the fire. We enter into this partnership as junior partners with God. Again, God created light. God empowers man to create fire. God kindled the light upon the altar with the fire that came from God. God commands Aaron and his sons to continue to kindle the fire upon the altar from then and on. And this again is the hallmark of the human condition, the summons and the opportunity that God gives us. Imitatio Dei, emulating God, going in his way. That godly capacity that God gives us as the means, ultimately, to elevating ourselves and elevating the entire world. Indeed, it is so apropos in this vein to consider the message of Moses in his final blessing in Deuteronomy chapter 33, which begins in verse 2, with God came from Sinai and rose from Seir unto them. He shined forth from Mount Paran, and he came forth from the myriads holy. At his right hand was a fiery law unto them. Now note, on the one hand, God shined forth from Mount Paran. So God, as it were, is shining upon us. And what he gives us by consequence of that is the fiery law, the Torah. The Torah, the teaching, 
that teaches us, as it were, how to take that gift of fire that comes from God because God gives us the wherewithal to go in his ways, to continue to illuminate the world over which he has shone. That's what life is all about. That's the summons. Fire symbolizes then our ability to be godly. But again, fire also represents that which can destroy, that which can lead us in the opposite direction. The dividing line here is so subtle, it's frightening. And here's where we really need to consider the crux of the Bible's message. Where indeed is that line of demarcation to be drawn between the fire that enables us to be godly and the fire that destroys? Now, of course, we might be inclined to answer, it's all a matter of what you have in mind. A question of intention. Is the intention to be godly, or the, is the intention to become surrogate gods? And that's undoubtedly part of the distinction to be drawn between these two fires. But that would make things a little bit too easy. Life is more complex. As we know from Dante's The Divine Comedy. The road to hell is paved with good intentions. So if you can't trust intentions to protect you from the fire that destroys, where indeed is that line of demarcation to be drawn? And I think to answer this question, it is instructive for us to consider a couple of illustrative stories in the Torah. They may not appear to have anything to do with the subject, but I think upon reflection, they definitely do. First, we consider what happens in the aftermath of the sin of the spies. Remember, the whole purpose of the Exodus as God designates it from the get-go at the burning bush to Moses in Exodus chapter 3 is to bring Israel to the land of Israel, to the promised land. But when in Numbers chapter 13, they hear the report of the spies, the evil report with respect to the land, they decide they don't want to go. And the punishment The punishment is, you're not going. You will die in the wilderness. Only your children will merit entry into the land. A decree that finally wakes them up to what they have done. And they literally wake up in Numbers chapter 14, verse 40. They rose up early in the morning, got them up to the top of the mountain, saying, Lo, we are here, and will go up unto the place which God has said, for we have sinned. So now we're ready to go in. As God said, wait a second. Yesterday, God said to go into the land, and you didn't want to. God now has said, you're not going in. And indeed, that's what Moses warns them in verse 41. Wherefore now do you transgress the commandment of God, seeing it shall not prosper? Go not up, for God is not among you. Yesterday, God said to go up. Today, God says not to. And he warns them. For as much as you are turned back from following God, God will not be with you. And they presumed to go up to the top of the mountain, and they're massacred. 
we read a description of the same event by way of recapitulation in Deuteronomy chapter 1. In verse 41, then you answered and said to me, we have sinned against God. We will go up and fight according to all that God our Lord commanded us. And God says, say to them, go not up, neither fight, for I am not among you. And you didn't listen. You were presumptuous. You went up into the hill country and you were massacred. And you know, you read this narrative and you ask, wow, what dedication? What did they die for? And the terrifying answer to this question inevitably is, what did they die for? Absolutely nothing. Nothing except their own egos. They did not die as an act of selfless dedication to the word of God because they violated the word of God. They may have wonderful intentions, but the definitive line of demarcation is, are you obeying what God said or are you not? Because inevitably, that's going to dictate whether what you're doing is godly or pretending to be God and giving out the orders yourself instead of heeding God's orders. One more illustration. This brings us a little bit closer to home with respect to the tabernacle. What we read in the second book of Samuel, chapter 6, when David is, he hopes, bringing the holy ark to Jerusalem. We read in verse 3, they set the ark of God upon a new cart and brought it out of the house of Abinadav that was in the hill, and Uzzah and Achio, the sons of Abinadav, drove the new cart. Verse 6, and when they came to the threshing floor of Nachon, Uzzah put forth his hand to the ark of God and took hold of it, for the oxen stumbled. Verse 7, and the anger of God was kindled against Uzzah, and God smote him there for his error, and there he died by the ark of God. And we recoil in horror and say, he killed him? Why? What did he do wrong? The oxen stumbled. He didn't want the ark to fall down. He had wonderful intentions. And of course, the answer, inevitably, of course he had wonderful intentions. But he didn't obey the word of God. You don't take care of the holy ark by putting forth your hand to the ark presumptuously you trust in god you obey it's not a question of good intentions granted it was an error it was an error for which uzzah paid with his life because again the critical line of demarcation between being godly and pretending to be God is, are you obeying? Do you issue the commands or do you follow the commands that are issued by God? And it is, of course, inevitably on that note that we return to Leviticus chapter 9 and chapter 10. It is indeed the same fire. The same fire that in Leviticus chapter 9 comes forth from before God in verse 24, signifying that the glory of God appeared unto all the people, verse 23. Same fire that in chapter 10, verse 2, came forth from before God and devoured the sons of Aaron. Why? It's stated explicitly, after all, in chapter 10, verse 1, 
which he had not commanded them. Undoubtedly, Nadav and Avihu had wonderful intentions. Again, Moses testifies, God said, through them that are near unto me, I will be sanctified. And again, we read later on in Leviticus, they drew near before God. That was their intention. That was their intention, but at the end of the day, it's not a question of intention, it's a question of deed. What are you doing? Are you heeding the word of God? They offered strange fire before God, which he had not commanded them. And they died. Because fire illuminates, fire warms. Fire, most critically, serves as a means through which we perceive God's presence manifest. But fire also consumes. Fire also devours. Fire also destroys. Ultimately, it is in our hands. Because it's really all the same fire. Just a question of the way we are relating to it. The way we are relating to God who sends the fire. And on that note, I'd like to conclude with two passages from the future. In Isaiah chapter 66, we see both of these fires because in verse 16, we see a fire of destruction. But in the previous verse, we see it's the self-same fire. In verse 15, for be behold, God will come in fire. God is coming. We have the opportunity to sense his presence. We have the opportunity to perceive him manifest to us. God will come in fire. However, it's the self-same fire that renders his anger with fury and his rebuke with flames of fire. For by fire will God enter into judgment and by his sword with all flesh and the slain of God will be many. The self-same fire that reveals to us God's presence also devours, also destroys as we saw in Leviticus chapters 9 and 10. It's all a question of not merely our attitude, but what we do. Whether indeed, when God enters into judgment, we will have been faithful to God's word. And finally, in this vein, and with this we conclude, in the words of Zechariah, in chapter 2, when we read of the Jerusalem of the future after that final battle, in verse 9, for I, says God, will be unto her a wall of fire round about, and I will be the glory in the midst of her. So, of course, once again, we see the juxtaposition of fire with God's glory. God's glory is revealed through the fire. The additional nuance, fire here is a wall. A wall that establishes boundaries. Because, you know, inevitably, we can all, I think, very, very well appreciate that what makes fire so dangerous is fire is always liable to get out of control. Getting out of control is exactly the problem. Getting out of control is exactly the difference between becoming godly and pretending to be a god. Getting out of control is the difference between fire that serves as the manifestation of God's glory. I will be the glory in the midst of her. Again, as we saw in chapter 9, verse 23, the glory of God appeared unto all the people when the fire came forth from before God. The difference between that and the fire that devours, that destroys, 
In the future, fire will be a wall to provide us with that clarity, that boundary line. In this world, we always need to be very sensitive, acutely aware of that danger, because it is precisely by appreciating these two aspects of fire that we can focus on what it takes to truly be godly, to obey God's summons, to do as he commands, and thus to indeed be able to perceive God manifest to us through the fire that illuminates what would otherwise be a dark world. That's the greatest blessing. May we make ourselves worthy of it. God bless you.